Hey folks, Doug Blake with Body Design University. Welcome to another weekly study. And in today's video, we're going to be looking at chapter seven and a particular area known as force couple relationships. Now, um, all you got to do is go through chapter seven and I hear it all the time. It's a rough chapter. And one of the reasons it's a difficult chapter is because it's on human movement uh, science, on the human movement system. And so if you look... It's right after the cardio respiratory chapter. It has a ton of material. Yes, absolutely. I know. I get it. It's a lot of information, a bunch of tables, but I'll just keep reiterating it over and over. Anytime I do, I, anytime I do a video uh, for the NASM textbook, and that is that what they did was they they took the plethora of information and they tried to make it as accessible as possible academically so that you could memorize, learn the concept and, um, and give you as much, you know, heads up as to what you will see on their actual exam. Please keep in mind, NASM's just not going to ask a whole lot of definition questions if they ask any at all. I think the most recent students that have been taking the exams, they basically say, for the most part, everything is, is, is going to be uh, situational type of questions, which is what we normally expect. But again, chapter seven, lots of information. You've got a bunch of um, sidebars for terminology. It's not that you. It's not that you don't want to. You know, not memorize stuff. You've got to memorize concept and concepts and terms. That's what helps you then to actually utilize the. Inf you can utilize that information to navigate through the through the more uh, difficult concepts. And that's where the subject we're going to talk about today, force couple relationships comes in. So remember, most of this, by the way, most of this material builds off of previous material. You have to understand what a concentric contraction is. How many of y'all know what a concentric contraction is? Do you know what an eccentric contraction is? This is where memorizing, reading, right? There's your, there's your note paper, read, write, and recite. You got to know some of the terms down pat so that now when you get to an actual concept known as force couple relationships, it will it'll actually make more sense. And, and when students are asking, can you explain this or can can uh, can you help me understand or what's the difference in the case of of this particular weekly session was was um, seeing a student ask, you know, is this the same as this is force couple relationships the same as synergists acting over a joint. And I trust me, I can understand where that confusion can come in because these terms are used in both force couple relationships and in just basic kinesiological terminology. So uh, terms like uh, agonist, antagonist, synergist, things like this. And the answer to that is no, they're not the same. And that's why I wanted to go over it because it's, it's really important to know the difference. Keep in mind, you you know, you navigate, you know, two sides to a coin here. One is you want to pass the exam. So you want to know the material well enough uh, to be able to answer basic questions on these particular topics if they, if they show up, right? Um, the other thing is that, particularly in the case of forced couple relationships, just so you know, I'm on page 211, if you have your textbook with you. This is real world stuff, folks. This is, this is what we use to determine range of motion, effective range of motion on a muscle. Do you ever wonder why a, um, a biomechanically inclined uh, trainer that knows his or her stuff about biomechanics will say, no, 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 don't go up any higher than this, or don't go lower than this. How do you determine range of motion? Well, um, some of it comes down to understanding force couple relationships. Even if you don't see anything on this on the NASM exam, Boy, I'm going to tell you, this is really important stuff to know in the real world after you pass the exam, hopefully, and start training people. When you're doing lateral raises, how far up do you go? How far down do you go? When you're doing a squat, how far down do you go? How far? It's all based on biomechanics. Okay. If you understand that, you can start to realize people are not training correctly. Their exercises, they're going way too far out of uh, effective range of motion. They're not doing effective range of, ranges of motion. Um, you'll be able to know that if you understand this concept. So that's my, that's my introduction. So again, chapter seven, page 211, human movement science. And the topic we're talking about is um, force 
couple relationships. And again, this is an important, um, an important concept to understand. I'm going to pull up our PowerPoint and um, get started for you. Now, the first thing we really need to do is kind of look at the sort of quintessential force couple relationship joint in the body, joints in the body. And that's going to be the shoulder and the scapular complex or the scapular humeral complex. And um, yeah, look, I, I snagged this from a, um, from a, uh, a video that you can find on the internet. I just wanted to show you very simply because it has a really good representation of force coupling. Ladies and gentlemen, force coupling is not every single muscle involved around a joint, even though NASM covers their, covers their, their butt, so to speak, by saying at the bottom of page 211, in reality, every movement produced must involve all muscle actions, i.e. concentric, eccentric, isometric, yes, and all functions, agonists, synergists, stabilizers, and antagonists. So they're covering everything. But no, in reality, no, no, no. That's not how we use force coupling in the real world. In the real world, force coupling is always associated with a particular kinesiolog kinesiological movement. What are your kinesiological movements? Flexion, extension, abduction, adduction, right? Dorsiflexion, plantar flexion. Okay, external rotation, internal rotation. Those are what are known as kinesiological functions. Um, elevation, depression, protraction, retraction. Those are all kinesiological functions or movements that occur at joints or multiple joints in conjunction. Force couple relationships go by this definition they have here on page 211, the synergistic action meaning everybody's helping each other out in some way, shape, or form, but their jobs are different. The synergistic action of multiple muscles working together to do what? To produce movement around a joint. And when you say movement around a joint, you're talking about kinesiological functions, okay? So when I perform shoulder abduction or shoulder adduction, okay, what am I doing? I'm producing movement around a joint. Now, again, we know, the, we know that there is the shoulder joint or what's known as the glenohumeral, glenohumeral joint, right? It's the humerus inside the glenoid fossa of the scapula. But in reality, it's not just, it's not just the movement of the glenohumeral joint. You have the scapulohumeral complex, right? Or what's known as the shoulder girdle complex. And as you lift your arm up and out to the side, as you can see, uh, for instance, in this in this picture right here, um, you can see that the scapula, the scapula, and the shoulder work in conjunction to create this movement that we call shoulder abduction or abduction movement away from the midline of the body. That's what abduction is. Okay, adduction is the exact opposite. Force coupling is simply it's a very simple uh, concept. And one of the easiest ways to remember force coupling is this concept of rotational movement. In the human body, there's two main, and again, I'm giving you very, very simple explanation, but there's two main areas that we really look at force coupling as, as an um, important component for human movement, and that's the shoulder and the pelvis, okay? So at the shoulder or the scapula, scapula, uh, glenohumeral area, right? The scapula and the shoulder joint itself, it moves in conjunction. There's rotational movement that allows shoulder abduction to occur. So it is the quintessential sort of um, poster child for this, for viewing or understanding, visualizing force coupling at the LPHC or the lumbopelvic hip complex. We have this similar similar functioning of the pelvis as it rotates back, right? Posterior and anterior tilting of the pelvis. Remember, um, you, you got to remember these, these concepts, right? That, that movement of the pelvis is rotational. It is another classic example of force coupling. Force coupling, we never talk about force coupling as an antagonist and an agonist. You just don't, it just doesn't make any have any relevance or make any sense in the real world of actual human movement and biomechanics. Although technically you could throw in the antagonist. 
What we do is we go by the basic definition that NASM has here. So it's a bunch of muscles that are all allowing for a basic function to occur. Okay, now watch and look at these. If you look at these pictures right here, what do you notice? You have the deltoid, right? So you got the deltoid muscle, but look at the arrows. And so these arrows are helping you to understand what force coupling is all about. And you'll notice that all those arrows all point in different directions, okay? This arrow is pointing up, that arrow is pointing this way, and these arrows define, now listen, the arrows define the way a muscle or the line of pull of specific muscles are occurring, okay? So when a muscle shortens, it creates what's known as a line of pull. Now the deltoid, just as a, for instance, the deltoid, when it shortens, it moves the, the humerus or the upper arm bone. And you can see it right here. It has a line of pull that's going to draw the arm outward. But now, wait a minute. You've got a lot of other muscles that are helping to assist in this movement. So for instance, the trapezius muscle right here, you can see the trapezius also is going to contract to do what? It's going to have a line of pull and you see this arrow right here, right? You can see me drawing this arrow. It's kind of circling this arrow. Stay with me. It's line of pull is going to draw. It's going to draw the head of the humerus into the glenoid. It's going to actually stabilize. Now I will say technically you can actually include the middle trapezius, which is what NASM is going to tell you, but the entire trapezius for the most part is going to contract, but notice, notice also you have the lower, and you see this arrow that I'm pointing to right here. See this guy? This is technically the lower trapezius. You could, you could also include the rhomboids if you wanted to act in as stabilizers, but you'll notice the line of pull is downward. And that downward pull is assisting. Now watch, see how I've got one side doing this and one side going up this way. This rotational movement is because you have multiple muscles pulling in different directions. This, this arrow right here, which represents sort of the upper trapezius moves. And let me, let me go ahead and show it to you this way. Because it moves in that direction, the serratus anterior muscle, which is this guy right here, actually has a line of pull that's directly opposite. It's actually pulling this way. So it complements the pull of the trapezius, complements the pull of the trapezius, actually complements the pull of the deltoid as well. But because it's attached to the bottom of the scapula, it assists with this rotational movement. So because it attaches at the bottom, this guy attaches at the top. It helps to rotate. It's a coupling. It's a force couple, which means that they are helping each other to produce a single rotational movement in this case. Hope that makes sense. Now, you also have this lower part of the trapezius and middle part of the trapezius that is literally pulling down this way, but yet the deltoid is pulling up this way. So you can see on opposite sides, they do this. They pull, one pulls upward, and on the opposite side of the scapula in this case, that insertion and line of pull then of the trapezius, middle to lower trapezius, actually pulls down and assists with this upward movement. They don't fight against each other. That's kind of the point, is that they actually assist with this, with this rotational movement, which then allows for effective abduction. You'll notice I use the kinesiological term shoulder abduction. Now, clearly there's a lot of muscles working and uh, in unison and in sync with this. Yes, I know what you're saying to me. Well, don't the lats and the pecs help and assist? Of course they do. All the muscles are involved in some way, shape or form. You have muscles inside the shoulder girdle, the infraspinatus. At this point, the infraspinatus, the subscapularis, the uh, supraspinatus, all of those rotator muscles, for instance, are acting synergistically to stabilize, to stabilize the glenohumeral joint itself against the scapula, just as a, for instance, yes, the pectoralis minor is also assisting and pulling like the serratus anterior, but 
you get the idea. I mean, we could, we could now say that pretty much every muscle at the joint is working. The point is, is that when we talk about force coupling in any, in any joint of the body, we got to be careful that we don't start pulling in all the muscles that are involved in just look at those that are the major players as stabilizers and actual prime movers and synergistic movers that go along with it. So now you've got to cut. Now I'm going to go back to the student that asked because he looked at a, he looked at one of the charts that was talking about synergists. And what I wanted to make sure you understand is that when we talk about force coupling, it's very targeted and very specific to a kinesiological movement. Whereas when we talk about synergistic muscles work and we're talking about an actual movement pattern or an actual exercise. So in order to, uh, in order to do squats, there are multiple muscles that assist with the movement. We're not talking, we're not talking specifically about the knee flexion and knee extension. Okay, now we would move into force coupling if you wanted to talk about exactly what's going on at the knee. What would be the force couple at the knee? But that's not, that's not what the student was asking, just as a for instance. Is synergistic muscle activity the same as force coupling? And the answer is no. In force coupling, we have synergistic application of muscle force to create an actual movement or kinesiological function. Hope that makes sense. Whereas when we're talking about an actual, just a plain old exercise like dumbbell curls or squats, normally it's, it's a compound type of movement. Um, we have lots of muscles helping each other do the actual exercise. If you wanted to take it to the next level, however, and say, well, during a squat, what are the force couples that are occurring during the squat? Well, now I got to go now I got to dig deeper down and I got to say, well, which joint are you talking about? Because the squat involves the ankle, the knee, right? The LPHC. Well, if you want to talk about the squat and now break it down from a force coupling perspective, now I can say, well, okay, at the lumbopelvic hip complex, we have a force couple going like this and muscles that are assisting and helping with the movement of the pelvis this way and stabilizing this way. Point is, is that force coupling, I want to just make sure I drive this home for you. Force coupling is a synerg synergistic activity to create a movement pattern. Now, yes, I know what you're saying to me. Well, can't we say kinesiologically that the scapula is moving through protraction somewhat, right? Because of the serratus anterior. And aren't we also getting external internal rotation and abd the answer is yes. But the focus on force coupling is going to be in this case, I'm just talking about this case in particular, shoulder abduction. If you wanted to talk about force coupling at the pelvis, for instance, and posterior pelvic tilting, or you can say hip flexion, for instance, is, are there force couples during hip flexion? Yes, there are. But now you're getting much more specific. Okay. So let me just, uh, I hope that makes sense. I'm just trying to make it as simple as possible to keep you in line with NASM's explanation. What I want to do to kind of finish this up is to help you now to look at figure seven, eight, and this is on page 211. Because again, you don't want to get confused. You don't want to get confused by the materials that they're giving you, because when it comes to taking the exam, you've got to be, you want to be very clear about what they are saying force coupling is. And I think if, um, I forgot where it was, it might, maybe it's chapter, um, 11 or one of the other later chapters where we see this synergistic app. Oh, no, that's probably still within, it's probably still within this chapter. Um, as a, as a matter of fact, yeah, it is. It's tables seven, three. So muscle synergies for common exercises. So, and, and again, here it is. What's the difference between figure seven, 18 force coupling and on page two twenty table seven, three. And the answer is this force coupling kinesiological function, shoulder abduction involves this force coupling, shoulder adduction involves this force couple, force coupling relationships. Okay, that's completely different than going to table seven, three and talking about muscle synergies for common exercises. Okay, so be clear, 
this is uh, table seven three is about exercises, just the general concept of exercises. And we know that in order to perform a squat, you have got your quads and your glutes and your hams act as synergists and stabilizers. That's not force coupling. That's not force coupling. The only time we generally see force coupling at this level in the squat is if we were to go directly into the pelvic area and say, okay, now I get it because the pelvis has to do this or this while I'm doing a squat. But force coupling itself is very specific, very targeted. And so when we look at uh, figure 718, just as a, for instance, here again, you see the, I hope you guys can see the arrows um, that we're talking about. So you got the arrows here, if you remember. Uh, let me go ahead and get, get our pen up. Remember, you got the arrows, you got all these guys, arrows all over here, right? Well, it's the same thing here. If you can, if you can see that we do have those arrows the same way. Now, again, NASM says middle trapezius as a stabilizer. Yes, lower trapezius actually pulls to counter the serratus anterior pull as well as the, as the actual pull of the deltoid muscle itself. And that's why this is a good, this is a good, uh, a good picture, but you can see how these arrows, these arrows, one pulls this way on one part of the scapula, another part pulls this way on the scapula, this pulls this way, this pulls this way. It creates a rotational effect. Okay. It's synergistic, meaning that they're all working together to create this, um, this one kinesiological movement known as shoulder abduction. And um, that's all you really want to know when it comes to when it comes to force coupling relationships. Um, I hope that wasn't confusing. You know, again, if you have comments on what we just went over, if you needed to, uh, if you need to gain more clarity, and I can explain it a little bit more for you. What I want to make sure you get from this from this particular video is that force coupling is not the same as muscle synergies in this particular part of the textbook in chapter seven. Um, you do want to know, obviously, table seven, three, but for the most part, I think you would, you would uh, just sort of know this just out of common knowledge, the muscles involved with the squat. If not, then you got to memorize it. Force coupling, it's a totally different, it's a totally different animal because now we're talking about how different forces work together or muscular pulling forces work together to create synergistically this rotational movement, um, and in this case, again, the, the sort of the ideal uh, picture for this is scapular rotation and movement, adduction and abduction of the scapular protraction, retraction of the shoulder girdle to produce the movement of the arm upward, known as, or outward and upward, known as shoulder abduction. As always, if you have uh, any comments or you need to get some more information on this or any other of the topics that, that is in the NASM textbook, leave the comments below. Remember to subscribe as well as uh, ding that bell so that you can get notifications when the new content comes out. Remember, our goal here at Body Design University is to help you pass the NASM exam on the first attempt, unless you've already taken it and failed, and now it's going to be your second or whatever attempt. We want to make sure that you pass it this time. Okay, so again, I'm hoping that this was helpful um, not just in this particular area, but keep in mind, anytime you're, you're, you're kind of studying some of these areas, make sure you use the sort of the general study tactics that we talk about as well, read, write, and recite. And anytime you get frustrated or you're having struggles with the material, just reach out to us, let us know, be more than happy to respond back and, um, and help as best we can. Have a great weekend and we'll see you next week. Thanks.